welcome everyone again, uh, and thank you for coming to the event. Oh, I just remembered I should slow down for the sake of the sign translators. All right, so, um, uh, so this is uh, our second panel for today, and I'm your moderator, Craig Lin. I'm from SGA, SG Enable. Uh, basically, we are uh, from the Tech Able team at SG Enable. Uh, and among the different things that we are doing, uh, we are involved in this initiative to build an, uh, an inclusive digital ecosystem for persons with disabilities. Hence, uh, we're happy to grab every opportunity we can to share with everyone on our initiatives. And we are very fortunate and blessed um, that we have uh, various other strong partners who are also able to join us today to share with us on the panel. And also through um, the through, through, um, Zero pro Projects context, we have also been put in touch with even more partners that we can have on our panel today to share. And hopefully after today, uh, even more will join us in this uh, collective effort to build an inclusive digital ecosystem for all. All right, so I will quickly just run through the uh, members of my panel and then hand over to them for their introduction. Thereafter, um, after the round of introductions, we'll go on to the, yeah, the meat of the presentation. Okay, so first off, we do have uh, Pratima from Microsoft. Uh, we have Josh from Edge Empathy. You notice Edge, uh, Josh is all over the place today. <laughs> but I do assure you, after the panel, you will just see him as the co MC. Uh, and next, we have Emmanuel from GovTech. And finally, we are very happy to have Rahma from Indonesia. Okay, so that's all I'll do for introductions, and I'll hand over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves and tell you more about what they do. Um, yeah, starting with Pratima. Thanks. So, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Pratima Munkar. Very honored to be here. Uh, many very familiar faces and friends in the audience. Um, just a quick visual descriptor of myself. I'm an Indian woman with uh, shoulder length black hair. I'm wearing a pink coat today uh, with uh, golden long earrings as well as golden diamond uh, 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 chain with a butterfly motif. What I'll do now is really tell you a little bit about the kind of work that we do with uh, digital inclusion and assistive tech. As you probably know, Microsoft is deeply involved, and many of you are using Microsoft tools, so I'll just like to highlight a few pieces there. I want to bring it to you with the humility that um, we are learning. It's a journey, and we are improving as we go forward. So do feel free to keep giving us feedback and happy to take as we go forward, um, uh, you know, um, developing and improving our products and our apps. So as a first step, let me just run a quick small uh, video for you, which highlights why we do it. The reason why we do it really is because our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And this for us is fundamental to every decision that we make in uh, Microsoft. Um, it is, it is hard-coded into our personal commitments. It's part of anything that we do, whether it is sales and marketing or product development or engineering. And uh, I know that all of you have been hearing a lot about the AI momentum that's been, uh, uh, you know, with, with us now. Uh, so fundamentally, this is what actuates everything that we do. This is what drives our job. Right, so now we'll hand over to Josh, then I'll let him tell a little bit about why he's on the panel, especially his ties to us as she uh, Perhaps tell us a little bit about his connection to Pratima as well. Right, so over to Josh. Yeah, so hi everyone. So it's me, I'm back again. So yeah, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Josh Sang. What I do in my day job when I'm not, uh, you know, being an MC is I lead a team at Edge Empathy, which is a non-profit organization. And specifically, I lead the unit uh, focused on uh, digital accessibility and accessibility projects. So 
We work very closely with SGI Enable, actually. We are their key vendor for anything related to digital accessibility solutions. So when someone has a digital accessibility problem, let's say uh, a certain company or government agency says they've got a feedback from users that their app is not compatible with assistive technology, uh, that's not an area that a lot of people specialize in. So how do we fix this problem? Right. If we want to do right by our customers, if we want to expand our market reach to users with disabilities, if we want to cater to other groups of users like senior citizens as well, uh, how do we approach this problem and how do we use user-focused uh, design methodologies to, to really uh, uh, comply with the kind of best practices that exist out there? So, uh, in, in effect, I am a uh, you know, digital accessibility specialist in, in that regard, so we work with uh, these people to consult them on their, on their problems. And if you've never heard of the idea of digital accessibility as a career path, hey, don't sorry, worry. Yeah, um, i cut you off here. Um, yep. You can see all our panelists are very passionate about their subject matter. Uh, <laughs> they're raring to start uh, right into, launch right into the conversation. Uh, but yep. we'll, again, look forward to that. Uh, okay, let's sure. Uh, hand over to Emmanuel now. So I'm um, Emmanuel. I'm, uh, I co-lead the team over at uh, GovTech that uh, is a central unit that looks into digital accessibility. Uh, we basically drive the initiatives uh, around all things digital accessibility within the whole of government. Um, another part of me is actually I'm also a caregiver myself. So I have a child with uh, complex medical needs. Uh, I'm very proud of that identity because part of the work that I do is really driven. Um, I have skin in the game, essentially. So really glad to be here and I'll just pass the time to uh, Rama. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Rahma from Suarez. Uh, we are focusing on disability inclusion in the uh, digital sector, and also we are a pioneer in digital accessibility consultants in Indonesia. And just a few months ago, I mean, until this month, uh, we were having like city to city empathy left pop up so to share the awareness. And I'm also one of the Zero Project Award winner a few years ago. I guess that's enough. All right, I think that's, that's just nice. Thanks, everyone, for us introductions. <laughs> okay, um, right, so um, just a little bit of a linker before we go on to, to the videos, right? So what happens is we have Microsoft here, uh, very important because uh, most of the world is still running on Microsoft. So um, having Microsoft here being uh, an ecosystem itself, practically, and the fact that they are totally committed and they do have accessibility design in place uh, is, is very important as the foundation for inclusivity and accessibility. Next, we do have um, Josh and his organization, which is working closely with us to go to the next level to build awareness uh, in Singapore on the need for digital accessibility and then to proceed to um, engage in efforts to uh, heightened accessibility of our digital assets. At the same time, we have Emmanuel from GovTech um, working parallel, um, kindred spirits, um, and along the way we met and we have been uh, close ever since. Uh, so after the experience with Singapore, we have Rahma to share uh, the experience with Indonesia right, so that we, have, um, we can all uh, have a chance to learn from one another's experiences. All right, so um, with that, um, Fatima, do you have anything to add before we go on to the videos? Um, I can take, uh, take the next step in going ahead with the presentation, sure. Yeah. Right, so... Maybe we can pull up the presentation. Then, yeah. Right, fine, great. So, yes. Thank you, and it's okay, I can get started. Thank you. This is the greatest time in human history to be blind. Education is all about communication. So you have to level the communication field and then the learning occurs. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to set up Eye Control, an application of Windows that allows you to control a mouse, keyboard, and text-to-speech experience using only your eyes. It was great telling me all the different shops as I passed, which is lovely, and the different street names as well. Quite often, I don't know which street's which. Approaching intersection, battery goes right. It's an example of Microsoft taking a leap forward using some of our research and our ability to innovate. I found the trash bin. 
Artificial intelligence is beginning to have an impact on the lives of people with disabilities, but it's only going to grow. There is still so much out there uh, to be done. By having people with disabilities in the fabric of our company, we're going to be building better services, websites, anything that we do will work across the spectrum of being human. I feel like I get to have a pretty significant uh, impact on Microsoft. We created the Xbox Adaptive Controller so everyone can game in a way that works for them and allow people to play together. The capacity to access technology opens up incredible doors. As I said earlier, uh, fundamental to everything that we do is the knowledge that accessibility drives innovation. In our previous panel, we had asked the question, Josh had asked the question, uh, why do people need to do it? And uh, that's really, uh, you know, fundamental to what we, uh, why we innovate. Because I keep hearing from customers, people come and ask us whether actually developing assistive tech or putting in accessibility into their tech, will it uh, curtail their uh, innovation or will it reduce their uh, speed to market? Uh, we work with so many application developers and the repeated uh, message that we give everybody is no. Accessibility drives innovation. There are so many examples of how um, making your tech accessible uh, will help not just people with uh, the need, uh, immediate need, but even people who may have a need which could be a temporary need in the future. You know, it could be even something as simple as that, or it could be something that is uh, semi permanent, it could be something that may be afflicting on um, a need that your friends or relatives may have. So, developing inclusively designed and accessible technology is the fundamental of the work that we do for our own tech as well as the work we do with our uh, customers and partners. Um, the three big pillars within that is how can you uh, practice inclusive design, making sure also that you keep soliciting feedback from everybody around you as well as uh, people from the community. So uh, this is where, as I said, uh, getting feedback from you is going to be very valuable as we go forward, as well as empowering others um, through uh, grant programs and through programs that we do with, uh, with technology partners, as well as partners such as SG Enable. So we run several programs with SG Enable where we actually work with um, people with disabilities to get feedback and greater to be able to uh, enhance employment opportunities. So that's the fundamental there. Uh, Windows 11, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, with the uh, interface of Windows 11. This is where uh, built-in accessibility features which support productivity, creativity, and ease of use. For example, live captions exist, uh, voice access, um, let me tell you a small story. Uh, one of the people on my team, she sprained her wrist. And this is so small, right? I mean, you sprain your wrist, but then you cannot do a lot of the typing. And what saved her with her emails and uh, for many weeks was exactly this voice access, being able to use and uh, command the product to do what they need using voice access. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is to uh, go back to the previous point about how accessibility can drive innovation and greater use for everybody. Uh, narrator, uh, which uh, talks back and tells you uh, what's written on the screen, as well as focus mode, which helps people, particularly with uh, need, uh, like ADHD or uh, autism, to be able to uh, cut out sounds, cut out uh, distracting um, uh, colors. Uh, all these features exist in Windows 11. Let me not spend too much time. Let me quickly run a video which will give you an idea of that. People with disabilities have different lived experience. We bring solutions to things that are really beneficial, better for everyone. The important thing is that you include us, and in that collaboration, we can create something together. 
And that is true human creativity. My role is developing features for our built-in screen reader narrator. You know, one of the pieces of feedback that we heard was that the voices were sounding very robotic. This is Narrator Home, where you can get... Think about listening to a voice eight hours a day. Recently, we are investing heavily to make natural sounding voices available in Narrator. Narrator is a screen reader that describes aloud what's on My favorite voice so is the ARIA the voice. Others really like the Jenny voice. To start or stop Narrator, press the Windows logo. Key the response was fantastic. Keep providing that level of feedback. It's a joy to be a part of that process. One of the biggest questions that the design team asked itself was, you know, how can we do better? Voice access allows the user to control Windows 11 completely hands-free. Show numbers here. Click for my personal favorite part of voice access is how beautiful it is. Assistive technologies tend to never get the same polish that perhaps mainstream experiences do. We really wanted to put our foot down and change that for the better. As designers, it's really important to try to solve for real problems and real people. It always went back to Leah's story. At the beginning of the pandemic, the things I didn't notice before became very clear to me and very frustrating, specifically the lack of captions. So I ended up using my laptop, plus I had my phone, and that's how I hacked my solution to give myself full access. Here is a huge opportunity for Windows as we think about the next set of features and something that can be really useful for a broader audience. Live captions, it's a really small piece of UI that you can move anywhere. It allows us to reflect back on how we can design better for everyone. It's really exciting. I joined conversations, I provided feedback, and now I use it in some situations and it is a game changer. You know, there's no I in team and it takes all of us. In order to create something to solve for one, we're also extending to many. And very quickly, just flashing a few other thoughts to you. Um, for those of us in the, in the room who are involved in developing this assistive tech, um, feel free to connect with me about things like Accessibility Assistant, which helps you actually develop uh, using uh, the tools and existing accessibility features that you can plug into your applications. Uh, those of you who are using Teams would see that we are constantly improving this to make it more assistive. Uh, things like live reactions, audio transcription, and so on, noise suppression, custom, custom backgrounds. Again, uh, uh, examples of assistive tech which exist in current, uh, uh, um, current tools and products. And uh, we did hear in the previous uh, videos about Surface, Surface Adaptive Kit, as well as Xbox. Xbox, which helps making gaming more accessible. So um, I will, I know, uh, you know, uh, hear from all of you. Feel free again to connect with me. And uh, I'm flashing on the screen a few of the help um, resources, which can take you into uh, some more of the products. Um, again, available for any questions as we go forward. So thank you. And shall I hand over to Josh now? Yes, Pratima. So thanks for the sharing. Um, so uh, I think I will, hopefully there will be time to queue this in again at the end of the panel. Uh, I believe the, this our forum today is not only about showcasing uh, innovation, it is also about building connections, just as SG Enable and Zero Project all believe in uh, collective impact, building connections so that more people can collaborate, uh, so that more people can, can uh, benefit. Uh, this panel does um, hope to, to showcase these two points as well. So um, efforts to build the uh, ecosystem can be said to be a form of innovation, but um, if we do have the chance to let you know, there is this um, connection between panelists. So uh, that's also another important thing to highlight. So hopefully when um, all of you do have a chance, as, as with the first panel, uh, 
most if not all our panelists will at least be around for a little while. So do come up and talk to the panelists, build connections to them so that we can all build the greater collective impact. So um, with that, uh, I'll pass on to Josh to uh, share more on how he has been working with Ash Enable to make a great impact. And also, I believe his views on uh, what else can be done. Right, so over to you, Josh. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Kevin. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, just to, to recap, so I lead a team that works with uh, stakeholders like SG Enable on digital accessibility initiatives. And this is really a nascent feeling, you know, like people who really think about accessibility even part-time or full-time, uh, you know, there's not a lot of us working on these kinds of problems. And you might wonder how someone like me would get started in it. Uh, I think for some obvious reasons, yeah, I'm a person with a vision impairment, so I have a vested interest in it. And, you know, as a person with a vision impairment, when I use some online tools like apps or websites or different types of software, and uh, I use a screen reader, so that kind of text-to-speech software that you saw uh, demonstrated a few times in some of the videos. Um, I use that on a daily basis. And when, that, uh, and when developers don't program their uh, apps and websites to proper accessibility standards, screen readers can't interface with it, and I don't know what's going on, basically. Like, if I can't read uh, uh, the pictures or the text on the website, then uh, I don't have access to this information. So it was always a point of frustration for me. Uh, trying to navigate the online world but not having access to this information. But when I started my studies at university, I went to Singapore Management University to study uh, information systems. So when I was taking my computer science and information systems courses, that was uh, when I realized that technology really has a place in solving these kinds of problems. Right? There do exist uh, technological standards uh, one of which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, and, you know, there are these things that exist to basically inform developers and designers on how to create inclusive web experiences. So, with that kind of technology educational background when I was studying at university and also a vested interest in it, that was when I decided, you know, this is, this is my calling when I'm, you know, discovering my purpose at, at university. And so, when I graduated, this was the journey that I embarked on and this is where I am today. So, if uh, I were to show on the slides, um, I have some pictures here. And uh, forgive me if I get the order wrong, but I just have a few uh, photos. So I think the first one that we have is a group photo with a property guru, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so we do conduct workshops in our programs and initiatives that we have with SG Enable. So uh, for example, we have funding from the uh, IMDA Digital for Life Fund. And in uh, partnership with SG Enable, we are able to offer these educational workshops and seminars to corporates and uh, different organizations and agencies on what is accessibility and how you get started. So you see the group of us that Property Guru, and we've done this workshop for many other places as well. Actually, we were also with um, uh, Manny Emmanuel at GovTech doing uh, such a sharing as well. So I think the next photo should be showing our user testing process. So as part of um, you know, making sure that accessibility standards are met and that uh, apps and websites are actually usable to people with disabilities, uh, one of the most effective ways is to test it, right? So panel one, uh, every single instance uh, from LTA to Hyundai Motor Group to uh, SBS and SMRT, every one of them embarked on user testing and that is essential to make sure that we really are developing solutions that are usable to people with disabilities. So I think on the photo should be showing a uh, testing session that we did for NTUC FairPrice. Uh, it doesn't look like much is going on, but actually what's happening is that we have two people with vision impairments using a smartphone to interact with the NTUC FairPrice app. And I think one of them should be quite thin. I think he's in the photo. So uh, that's uh, part of the process. Um, we also uh, are very active in terms of advocacy. So uh, I think the last photo that I have there before the the robot. Uh, but the, the last photo that I have there of what we do is uh, uh, we, were invite, we have been invited to many conferences, including this Zero Project conference, and I think the photo there is uh, one where we were invited to IDC, so International Data Corporation. Uh, the last uh, photo that I have up there 
to uh, show you. You might be wondering why is there a picture of a robot guide dog. So we also do advisory work with other people developing solutions. So actually, um, very similar to a lot of the people uh, in the audience right now. So one of the projects that I have been an uh, on and off advisor for is a team at NUS, uh, National University of Singapore, developing a robot guide dog for the blind. And uh, I think this is one of the projects uh, and initiatives uh, to do such a thing that has gone quite far. They want to uh, install it in uh, many different public facilities as well. And the way that they approach the problem using uh, both sensors and robotics, uh, I think they're on the right track. And we also work with uh, other uh, university and commercial institutions on uh, uh, research projects. So for example, um, one of the projects that I've been involved with is developing a framework for developing conversational agents using AI that can help people with vision impairments when they are accessing public facilities. So yeah, that's a little bit about the work that we do. And um, to, to round out, uh, I have uh, two points on the screen. So uh, I think there are two key gaps that we can, take at, uh, that we can acknowledge and address in terms of bridging the gap in accessibility. So the first one that I have up there is communication. I think there's still a lack of understanding of what accessibility is and what it means. I wish uh, every, every person and every stakeholder we talked to was as understanding and knowledgeable as Microsoft, you know, but not everyone is an expert in the space, and I think we have to recognize that. And so one of the roles that SG Enable and we and um, even uh, everyone else here actually is that, you know, we have to advocate for the community and help people uh, developing technology solutions understand what it actually means to design inclusive technology. And by uh, following that, that, that's where we can actually find innovative solutions. So the solutions that exist in the world, uh, they ha are better than they've ever been before, but there's still a lot of room to address many different needs. What about inclusive healthcare? What about inclusive transportation? There's a lot of things that uh, still need to be addressed. There's still a lot of problems that still need to be looked at. And so that's where we can develop solutions for that. So, in order to uh, start with communication, I'd just like to end off with uh, sharing a little bit about one of the experiments that my team and I have been doing in 2023, and that is using social media to try to connect with the wider public and change people's minds on what accessibility actually means and what it is in the first place. So I have two uh, very short videos for you. We've been using TikTok and uh, Instagram, and we've gotten actually a quite a few million views. I think the last I checked is uh, we're we going to be past 15 or 18 million views soon. So uh, over the course of 2023, we've made a few uh, videos on different topics related to accessibility. So the first one that I want to show is actually explaining what a screen reader is. I've mentioned it a few times, so here we go. Here's uh, what a screen reader is in 45 seconds. How do blind people use smartphones? All iPhones come with this thing called voiceover, which you can find in the accessibility settings. Voiceover on. Voiceover is a type of screen reader, which is a software that reads text on the screen to help blind people like me. Here I am reading on Twitter. And tweet. Josh saying dark sunglasses. Stories about my life with blindness. And yes, it also reads emojis. And voiceover also comes with other gestures for scrolling. Items 2 to 6 to 47. Items 4 to 9 to 47. Double tap to select. Josh saying profile photo. Josh saying dark sunglasses. Stories about my life with blindness. Blacking out the entire screen using this gesture for privacy. You can type O O R O L F D D and even read poetry. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let me down. Never gonna run around or desert you. Yeah. So that's uh yes poetry yes. <laughs> so uh, all of you got Rick rolled. All right. So yeah. You're not trying to find effective and concise ways to keep people's attention because attention is, very, is, a, is a valuable commodity right now. And uh, trying to explain concepts like this where screen readers are actually quite an abstract concept for most people because most of you are not using screen readers in your daily life. Um, another area that we like to, uh, like to touch on and just show another 35 second video is on how little uh, inclusive design features in video games can actually enable blind people to play video games. 
This is how blind people can play Pokemon. In the older generation of Pokemon games, the player can only move in four directions. And when you bump into walls, it makes that sound. These two simple facts actually make it very possible to navigate the world of Pokemon games even if you're a totally blind gamer. Other life hacks include memorizing all of the Pokemon cries. That's Trico, Torchic, Mudkip, and that's Magikarp. Everything else can be explored through trial and error. Would you like to see me do a playthrough of the game? Yep, and that video across Instagram and TikTok has over 2 million views. Yeah, so that's the power of... Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we were very amazed too. I remember I was in a hotel room uh, on an overseas trip and my phone just started buzzing. And I was like, what on earth is going on? And I looked it up and whoa, we were like approaching 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 views. By the end of the day, it was sitting at 400,000 views. So yeah, to, to date, uh, that video across two platforms has 2 million views. And it, it just goes to show, you know, when we try to uh, understand what people uh, are lacking in their knowledge and try to bridge that gap and try to make it fun and interesting, right? That's when we have a lot of uh, uh, ability to make a difference. So yeah, that's a little bit about some of the stuff I do. Hopefully it's interesting. And yeah, I don't want to hog any more of the time. Let's uh, move on to Manny and Rama to share about what they do as well. So you see, uh, yeah, Josh is doing the co emceeing So I'll hand over to uh, Emmanuel. <laughs> oh, sorry, I quite been. I still have not gotten out of the moderator mode, but yes, sorry. <laughs> No worries. Just say I love your brand of poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I just want to introduce someone also with me today. So, that's uh, Tsuyang over there from my team. So, we are part of the accessibility enabling team. Uh, enabling, because we, we love the, the, the term. Um, a little bit about the team. Um, what many people don't know is uh, the team actually started out as a ground-up initiative in DovTech. It was just a bunch of engineers and designers who decided that they wanted uh, to build more accessible services. Um, I was formerly from uh, the SingPass uh, team, uh, which essentially in Singapore, it's the digital identity system on a team. And for a digital identity system, um, it's very important that everyone gets access to government services. How all this started, uh, I have to blame Elvin over there. Four, five years ago, he gave a talk at um, one of the UX meetups and I was kind of brought into the world of uh, assistive technology. Um, the accessibility enabling team really runs by two principles. So first is uh, nothing without us, uh, nothing about us without us. Um, it's really something we truly believe in. Uh, the makeup of the team is actually quite uh, diverse as well. We, uh, of course, uh, Tsuyang himself is an AT user. We really believe that um, you, can't, um, you can't do work without being part of the community. Uh, something in tech that we, we often share about is Conway's Law, which is uh, whatever product you develop is a reflection of your organization. And one of the things we really believe is, can we hack Conway's Law for our benefit? By making the team diverse, perhaps we can also be really inclusive in the way we produce our work. The second principle we really believe in is uh, progress is over perfection. So um, one of the things that we started as a ground-up initiative um, was uh, let's not wait for the bosses to sponsor this. We, in the morning, we did um, our day job. We were building applications for um, the whole of government. We were building our apps for citizens. Uh, on 7 to 10 p.m., what we did was we conspired on how could we uh, propagate accessibility uh, to our colleagues because we felt that it couldn't stay within just a, a small bunch of us who were just doing it within our own products. So um, we launched our very first uh, learning festival um, as volunteers. So we asked for some money from the bosses, they gave us some, and uh, we, we got like a, a good bunch of uh, public officers to join us uh, to just discuss what uh, accessibility looks like in the government. Um, accessibility isn't new in government, it's been around for a long time, but digital accessibility is really nascent. And I think what we really did was uh, just to, uh, we haven't reached 2 million views yet. <laughs> Maybe I should start TikTok for public offices. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, what, what we, has really happened is we have run um, three of these festivals. And the last run we had, I think we hit most of, uh, I think we had at least one person from every agency in Singapore joined us uh, for our learning festival. Uh, other thing that we do is we build um, assist 
we, we built an accessible testing tool. So um, later when you have time, go speak to Tsui Yang. He's the guy that's the, uh, the tech lead over there. We built this tool called Purple Hats. Uh, long story on why it's called Hats, but purple because color of inclusion. Uh, it is an automated um, accessibility testing tool uh, running on the X engine. So if uh, you techie out there, uh, X is one of the best in class um, accessibility testing engines out there. What's unique about our tool is um, there are many tools out there. There's many commercial tools out there. Why we decided to build our own tool is uh, first, we wanted to make sure that we had an open source solution uh, for people to leverage on. Um, the other thing is um, we wanted a, a safe and secure way uh, for government officers to self-help themselves to understand uh, what's the state of accessibility on their website. Um, you can't change what you cannot see. You can't change what you're not aware of. So what we wanted to do is to give uh, officers a way to see the state of accessibility so they can't unsee what they just saw. Because as you know, a lot of websites aren't accessible right now, even um, yeah, government websites, essentially. So uh, what we've done with the open source tool is um, what's unique about our tool uh, versus commercial tool is uh, you can actually sp uh, scan past um, captures, uh, which is one of the few key things that blocks like uh, commercial tools from actually scanning uh, transactional service. And much of the government tools that is uh, important for citizens uh, is transactional. You have to log in, you have to submit a form, uh, you have to go through capture. Um, the other thing that we do is um, we are able to scan past um, sync pass, which is um, the, the login mechanism that you have to go through. So a digital tool can't do that. And because sync pass is a very secure thing, um, we don't allow commercial tools to uh, log in through your credentials. So with that tool, public officers can actually uh, test their forms, um, whether paying taxes is accessible. Uh, apparently, one of the most accessible, accessible sites in Singapore is your tax portal. Fantastic revenue. <laughs> yeah, but what we really believe is uh, that we are, we are trying to influence one agency at a time on how uh, you could make even form filling a less painful experience. Uh, we, we have uh, influence uh, our friends who built um, Form SG, which is uh, the, one, the Google form for government. I know Josh was part of testing it. Uh, I can safely say today that the current iteration is far more screen reader friendly than it was before. And uh, that form uh, tool is actually particularly very important because um, grants applications sometimes go through them. Um, contact details uh, between citizen and the government goes through the form as well. And uh, that's one of uh, the things that we have done. Uh, as a caregiver myself, um, again, total skin in the game, uh, we are also looking into building um, uh, augmentative uh, alternative communication tools, uh, AAC, because my, my daughter doesn't, uh, she has a tracheostomy, so that uh, impedes uh, speech. And uh, one of the things we do is uh, how can we white space and think about how can we leverage technology uh, to really benefit um, citizens. Uh, one question I love to pose to people when they ask the question, especially when we are asking about funding, it's a uh, why are you focusing on such a small like community, right? You know, if you do with the census, it is it's not large by numbers. Um, one of the things I like to ask is, uh, how many people in this room right now could benefit from inclusive design? The answer is not just our friends who are VI or our friends who are wheelchair users, but actually all of us benefit. Um, I benefit from uh, inclusive technology because my daughter benefits. And when you build inclusive technology, I'm preaching to the choir here, all of you believe this way here, right? Yeah, but well, if you need a business case, you need just steal this line. Yeah, because um, when you're designing inclusive technology, um, it's not just a person with disability that benefits, it's the families behind them. It's societies that they belong to, communities that they belong to, um, colleagues that they work with. Right, the whole of society benefits when technology is accessible, and that's one of the core uh, beliefs that we have that's driving our mission. Uh, just, just to end, um, one of the things we really, really believe as well, and I will just steal one line that I read from um, uh, Prof Wong uh, Mengi, who's here as well, is that we're trying to move beyond just goodwill to good practices. So the last thing that we really are doing right now is how are we um, rewriting um, our digital service standards of uh, the government, the Singapore government, uh, to spell out uh, how accessible technology should be developed. So we are in the midst of uh, rewriting some stuff. Uh, so there's better guidance on what inclusive design looks like. We steal a lot of things from Microsoft because I think they have a great toolkit. If you have not uh, heard of it, Microsoft has this uh, inclusive design 
um, a toolkit that a lot of us borrow from. Uh, it has a great framework of like contemporarily uh, situational and uh, permanent disabilities, and I think that's that's great framework that we uh, we steal, lah, right? No, lah, it's open source, right? Yeah. The correct <laughs> word steal. is leverage. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We are leveraging and uh, we are adapting from that. So that's that's our work from the accessibility uh, enabling thing. I won't share too much. Uh, do hang around, chat with us. We'd love to see how we can better collaborate and even learn from uh, folks across uh, Zero Project as well. Thank you. All right. So thanks, Manny. So you can see how all our panelists are also totally in on the connections thing, shouting out to members in the audience who are connected to us. Um, but anyway, um, we better get moving on. Uh, so we move from Singapore. So it takes three of us from Singapore to stand up uh, on the same stage as one person from Microsoft and one person from Indonesia. And so now we have our speaker from Indonesia, Rahma, to share on her story for uh, Indonesia. Rahma, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm so women have the first word and the last word. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I also have the slide. So hello everyone. My name is Rama from Indonesia again. And um, as one of the project uh, zero project winner, I will share uh, the learning curve that hopefully you can replicate, adapt it, and whatever you can do with these presentations. So we start with. In the rest of the world, you will have reasons why you have to implement digital accessibility for legal, ethical, uh, better experience, and accessible uh, website, often less to maintain or even ACO. But those reasons is not applicable in Indonesia. None of, the, uh, of us have the regulations about digital accessibility. Most of them even don't know what this accessibility is. Almost zero awareness instead of zero project. And they always say, oh, person with disability is not our target audience, always. And then uh, we are agile. We need to build fast and crash fast. Don't, we don't have time for accessibility. So forget all of those um, advocating on the rest of the world. So this is what we do. Um, so how we can build digital accessible infrastructure in Indonesia if no expert no reinforcement, no curriculum in the university, super duper almost zero awareness, and left alone the stereotype. So most of the country have the regulation, right? We don't ho have it yet. Hopefully next year, because we are working with Open Government Indonesia to push these regulations. And uh, we try to divide the target audience for your context before creating SUARIs. Um, I'm a creative director in digital advertising agencies for almost 10 years, so I have an advertising background and design. So the main target audience is the company, NGOs, and government, right? But we also have people. So whether it's the platform creator, designer, UX, um, developers, and also social media users, <laughs> like TikTok. <laughs> and every single entities that we target is actually have motives. And every um, B2B organization also have people inside. So there are extrinsic uh, motivations come from the outset, and also intrinsic motivations come from the inside. But unlike Emmanuel, who are a caregiver, not everyone have families with disabilities. So it cannot be an intrinsic driver. So we have to define what moves the target audience, what to say to them, and how to make them want it. Because accessibility is not only a knowledge, but also an actions, right? So um, for the first one, especially for the companies who always said, this is not my target audience. So the way we do it is to show competitive advantage from head to head competitors. So instead of the reinforcement, we don't have it, head to head competition and also the number of persons with disability in Indonesia. We do that in order. So it's not the person first, so the competitor first. And this is affecting their brand image, their potential customer acquisition, and also about the metrics. Because the metrics is not, is not only purchase power, the metrics also about readability, retention, time on page, everything. So when we say about this, so we create Tantangan Accessibilitas. Uh, it's accessibility challenge in Bahasa Indonesia. The concept is to write a versus. 
So if you know Uber, and in, in Singapore also we have Gojek and Grab, right? So which one is better in accessibility, Gojek or Grab? <laughs> and what I know from the inside is, um, if they have incident like this, they will not prioritize unless their competitor do it better. So I use that inside. Um, and then we replicate that. Which one is better, OVO or Mobi uh, BCA Mobile, or Flip versus BCA Mobiles? And the video on the left, uh, on Gojek and Grab, also not moving the organization directly, but it moves the team. And even until now, they said they unable to create better video than this when they try to present to, to their stakeholders. So please replicate this. <laughs> and the second one is how minority is minority. Because in Indonesia, according to the statistic, we have 26 million persons with disability and, 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 oh wait, it's almost the same as the whole Australian populations. Is it minority? So it's also your potential customers, potential key metrics for you to utilize. Move to the second one on the personal, so platform creators, social media users. So every person might have a very limited um, capacity or leverage because not everyone is decision makers, right? And also the amount of a person can receive at one time is very minimum. That's why in advertising, we have this KISS method, keep it simple. Now, uh, that one, if you know, one message at one time. So what we are trying to do is how we deliver the message, the communications, uh, like Josh said, uh, in familiar or relevant context to each person. And it has to be doable because they need to do something, not only knowing of, and also demonstrate the example. Because um, theor theory won't work, so they have to demonstrate it. So what we do, before that, I give two facts about Indonesia. The first one, I think most of you already know, we have the biggest uh, Muslim population in the world. And the second one, we are the number one for three years straight for the most generous country in the world. Um, very good self-compassion, um, I can say. And the way we use this inside is, the first one is Kamis keyboard. Um, translated into keyboard Thursday. So we ask, especially for the um, platform creator, to access one website or at least one page just using keyboard only, without using the trackpad, without using the mouse, with just a tab button on your keyboard. Everybody knows tab button. Everybody use tab button. So we explain how to do this and what they can discover using these methods, and it's not a rocket science. For example, you have to go return to the address bar, and that means you don't have keyboard trap. It is accessibility, something like that. So even one. Um, and the later is the right hand side is beside the access, or translated into can be access. So the focus on giving alt text in image on social media. So we're translated to help uh, people with vision impairments to enjoy Instagram more by adding alt text to your image in social media. So this is for the public. So, and to add a weight on those um, campaigns. So we always give the tantangan accessibilitas first, and then when we demonstrate, especially to the developers, and say, well, this button is not readable. So imagine if your line of code create better, you can help up to 3.5 million blind users in Indonesia. So imagine the impact of one line correct code. Okay, so the developers start to think. I will add alt text, or I will add content description later. And also, if you're a Muslim, you must, um, there's a concept of amal jariah, which uh, a good deeds that will continue um, into your savings of the good deeds. <laughs> uh, keep going on, keep going on. So I will always say this, if let's say the company doesn't reinforce this, perhaps you can consider this as amal jariah. So they start to think about it. 
So last thing, awareness is never enough. Every of us need to act consistently in a very possible manner. So this is what we do. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Rama. So, you know, Rama is Knowledge Director at Suarez, right? So you can see why she's Knowledge Director. There's so much knowledge she was sharing. I believe uh, she has given us a lot of good pointers for pitching digital accessibility to our potential stakeholders. So we thank her for that. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's like the previous panel. Um, so once we have people really passionate about their topic, uh, we can really go on and on. So. Um, much as we would like to have extra time for um, question and answer and perhaps more interaction, um, I, I guess I'll have to sort of uh, end it around here. Although I think I do want to, um, again, do a, uh, do a sell of our panelists to all of you. So like uh, you have heard, basically all of our panelists have offered themselves up for more connections. So uh, if anybody out there is interested in accessibility, do feel free to approach us definitely. Um, that's really, I really wanted to like, get uh, Pratima to share more on what she has been doing because, for example, she, she was sharing previous, um, at a pre-panel discussion about how she actually was driving uh, courses to promote, uh, to advise um, different entities on app development. So Pratima, you were, you were talking about uh, sharing with Grab, right? Uh, did Goja approach you? Yeah, so... <laughs> um, Thanks, thanks for opening it up. Yes, we have been working with uh, customers um, like large banks uh, as well as ride-hailing apps, etc., to help make their apps more assistive. And um, also we were sharing in our pre-panel discussion how Josh and Rama and uh, we have uh, done work together in the past, right? And Josh also. And uh, um, in fact, I also want to share NaviLens was another uh, app which we were working with. So. Yeah, absolutely. So anybody who's doing assistive tech, feel free to ping us. Happy to work. We are running programs with SG Enable also on this topic. Yeah, did, did Goja approach you? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> they show us, right? No, I... Yeah. Okay, so it shows why, right? Um, all right, so um, once again, uh, thank you to all the panelists for being here. So we see uh, Microsoft beyond just building the foundation, they're also driving accessibility as well. Then we have our drivers in, in, uh, locally in Josh and, and GovTech uh, Emmanuel. And then of course we, we have see, we see a very similar story evolving in um, Indonesia. So um, we're really happy that we are now connected and, and looking forward to more connections. So uh, thank you all. Uh, do feel free to look us up again. And, and yeah, that's it for now. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>